So now that we understand how to model capacitance and resistance in a wire, let's look at how, when we insert wires into circuits, how we can model them so that we see their impact primarily upon delay. Wires are, of course, going to have an impact upon power dissipation as well because they increase the capacitive load that our gates observe as well as having a resistance of their own. But our main concern now is to look at how they impact delay and how they impact the time constants that uh, gates observe. So we're going to look at two models for uh, wires. The first is the lumped capacitive wire or lumped C wire. And in this case, we're going to assume that the resistance of the wire is negligible, which allows us to model the wire as a single capacitance or a lumped capacitance, representing the capacitance of the entire wire uh, over its entire length. And the second model is the RC model, in which we are going to assume that the wire has some resistance and thus has to be represented as an RC circuit. Later on, we're going to also look at what happens when inductive um, effects start to have an impact on the wire. What happens if the wire, uh, if wire inductance is also significant? So let's first look at the lumped C model. And this is a model that we will apply uh, almost exclusively for metal wires. Uh, and again, this makes sense in older technologies where the resistance of wires was uh, pretty insignificant compared to their capacitance because older wires used to be wide and uh, relatively long and also uh, relatively thick. So they had a small resistance and a large capacitance. But above all, uh, in older technologies, the frequency of operation was small, which reduced the skin, the skin effect. This is not true for modern technologies, so even metal wires may not be, um, it may not be such a good idea to represent them as lumped C. Uh, but it is a useful model when we are doing back of the envelope, envelope cal calculations. And so uh, metal wires are usually used to uh, create connections between different uh, gates. And the reason for this is because the drains of CMOS gates are usually going to be connected uh, to each other using a metal uh, wire. And that's because uh, this section is composed of diffusion, this section is composed of diffusion, but they are of opposite types. So this is uh, N plus and this is P plus. And therefore, to connect them, we have to use a higher layer, which is going to be the metal one layer. This means that the outputs of, of uh, gates are usually in the, in the metal one layer to begin with, which allows us to then route these outputs to the next gate in the metal one layer. Now, this is going to have to make a contact down to polysilicon as soon as it reaches the next gate because the gates are, the MOSFET gates are in polysilicon. So, in the lumped C model, all we are saying is that this section of wire, this entire section of wire, is going to be represented as a single capacitance. And the value of that single capacitance can be calculated as epsilon oxide, and this is called the C wire, epsilon oxide multiplied by width, which is the, the, defined by DRC, multiplied by the length that we travel between the two gates and divided by the height of the wire, of the metal wire above the substrate, which is... Uh, dictated by technology, but it's also dictated by which metal layer you're using specifically. So if you have to go to upper metal layers while doing the routing, uh, then for that section, you have to use a different T. Uh, if you're doing, if you're doing it, it all in metal one layer, then you're going to use a single T. So at the end of the day, um, all that's going to happen is that you're going to represent this wire using a lumped capacit capacitance called C wire, whose value you can calculate from all the givens of the problem. These givens are not necessarily technology defined, but are also design defined, especially when we are talking about the length of the wire. Now, the question is, what is the time constant at the output of this inverter with and without taking into consideration the effect or the impact of the wire capacitance? So the ideal time constant of the first inverter, which is the gate time constant of this first inverter is going to be R. And R is going to be either Rn or Rp, depending on whether we are doing a high to low or a low to high transition, multiplied by the total capacitance that we observe, which in this case would be Cd1 plus Cg2. So the drain capacitance or the self-loading of the first gate and the external capacitance or the gate 
input capacitance of the next stage. This is the gate capacitance, the gate time constant of the first inverter. Now, if we want to find the time constant using the lumped capacitor model and taking into consideration wire capacitance, all that's going to happen really is that we're going to add this wire capacitance in parallel with these two capacitances. And so you have CD1 plus CG2 plus C wire. And so you can see that the time constant is divided into two components, R into CD1 plus CG2 and R into C wire. And so this is going to be the gate time constant or the gate delay, and this is going to be the interconnect or wire time constant or wire delay. And so you can see that the impact that the wire has is that it increases capacitive loading on the, on the gate, thus requiring the gate to do more electrical effort, thus raising the uh, delay of the gate. And again, this is external loading, not self-loading. Now, at this point, it's important to discuss another kind of capacitance that we observe in wires. So if you look at these two wires, and um, these are ostensibly wires that we are drawing for an older technology. So for older technologies, wires were, uh, you know, a little bit thinner and wider and separated by more distance. This is because uh, DRC, design rules, are dictated by the um, uh, technology parameter and therefore distance in absolute terms between wires is going to be larger in older technologies and smaller in modern technologies. So we always talk about uh, the wire to substrate capacitance when we discuss capacitance, but there's another capacitance which is the interwire capacitance. This is the uh, capacitance we observe between the two wires instead of the capacitance we observe between one of them and the substrate. This is generally small in older technologies because the distance between these wires is uh, large and because the height of the wires is relatively small. So if you want, if we want to calculate the uh, value of this capacitance and we are going to assume that it is a parallel plate capacitance, then it's going to be epsilon oxide because the two wires are still separated by silicon dioxide multiplied by the uh, plate area. The plate area is going to be the length of these wires multiplied by their uh, thickness, which is Tw, and then divide, divided by the separation, which is Ls. Now, this is small because uh, L times Tw is small, mainly because Tw is small, and because Ls is also big. They are separated by a large uh, distance. Now, when we move to modern technologies, we will see, when we talk about uh, scaling of wires, we will see that we have to make the wires relatively thick. So the wires are going to get, uh, you know, uh, narrower. W is going to decrease because W is going to decrease as the technology improves. And um, distance between wires is also going to decrease because design rules are going to allow wires to be packed closer together. And also, when we look at, at how wires scale, this will lead to an increase in resistance that is simply untenable if the thickness of the wire was also allowed to go down. So actually, the thickness of the wire is not allowed to go down as fast as other dimensions are allowed to go down, which means that the thickness of the wire becomes relatively high relative to other dimensions because it is not scaling down as fast as them. Now, this will lead to a much higher interwire capacitance. First, because Tw, or specifically the product Tw times L, is going to keep at the same value or even increase. Chips are becoming larger. The length of wires is becoming longer and TW is not scaling down as fast. So that area is going to increase and wires are going to be packed uh, closer together, which means that LS is going to also decrease. So this interwire capacitance is going to be much increased. And so how, how do we take that into consideration? How do we um, model it? So uh, wire to substrate capacitance was really easy to model because it just adds more capacitive loading to a, a gate and thus increases its delay. But interwire capacitance is a problem. So what happens with interwire capacitance is that you have a wire and another wire running along it. And maybe this is uh, delivering data from one gate to another. And this is delivering data from uh, one gate to another. And so they are in two independent branches or two independent paths. And what the interwire capacitance does is it connects these two wires together.
And so it leads to crosstalk. It doesn't lead to delay, it leads to crosstalk. It just means that this signal, X1, is going to feed into this wire, and this signal, X2, is going to capacitively couple into this wire. So it leads to interference, a very, very significant source of noise, not actually noise, systematic noise, which is interference. And so this could be really destructive. This could be uh, really huge, and we have to talk about how to deal with it, and we will do so when we talk about wire scaling.